Well, hello, everyone. I'm very honored to be here tonight to recognize Dr. Roth. And I'd like to personally thank her because it was August 2004 when I literally woke up one morning and thought, I want to go back to school and get my PhD. Well, the program wasn't quite as impacted as it is now. And so I started that fall on special student status. There was two of us in that cohort. It was Jeannie Maiden and myself. And so I'm forever grateful that you facilitated my way into the program so seamlessly on such short notice. I'm also very grateful, and I have already heard it mentioned a couple of times about the partnership we have with you, Dr. Roth, and Sharp Healthcare. We have three Robert Wood Johnson Future of Nursing Scholars, and two of them are here, Melissa Yeager and Rochelle Sai. And it's truly been a blessing to Sharp. We have if I combine all the full-time, part-time, and per diem nurses, we probably have over 45 nurses with a doctorate, primarily a PhD from the University of San Diego. And our leaders, truly, we have two CEOs that have their PhD in nursing from the University of San Diego, and we have one executive vice president of hospital operations, and that's Dan Gross, who will be retiring early in April. But he is also a doctorally prepared nurse from uh, from USD, and I think we're really grateful that we have the commitment from our organization for education. I probably overprepared. I do have some slides, but I'm going to go zoom right on through them because I know there's three more speakers between refreshments, right, for all of you. I was asked to talk on healthcare systems, and I decided since what USD does is prepare the future nursing workforce either uh, entry into practice or graduate level, advanced practice, doctoral level, I decided to contextualize my remarks into nursing workforce trends. And some of it is a little bit of past, some future, probably some call to action as well. So a little bit more about my role at SHARP. I am vice president of the Center of Nursing Excellence, now the Castor Institute. I would not be in my position without a doctoral degree. My previous role, the same, I was director of research and education at Sharp Memorial, and the degree was essential to my role. I think the degree has allowed me, and it's really important that no matter what we do, we're always measuring outcomes, and so a lot of my work at Sharp is measuring program outcomes, program evaluation, so having the degree has given me the knowledge and skill to do that. It also brings credibility for me, no matter what circle I am traveling in, and whether that's leadership at Sharp or I'm also president-elect of the Association of California Nurse Leaders. I was on a call yesterday with a lot of big wigs throughout the state. The two topics were the change at the executive level for the Board of Registered Nursing and a bill that's been introduced for California to enter the compact, the nursing compact for licensure. And so for me to be in that, on that phone call, um, the degree brought me some credibility. So some of this, again, call to action, some of it's highlighting, uh, news release just this week, and this is really important to USD because what USD does is, it, again, prepares nurses for the workforce. Big uh, proposed federal cuts to funding, and you can see here majority of the Title VIII nursing workforce development, with the exception of the Nurse Corps program, would be eliminated. And this also includes cuts to the National Institute of Health and the National Institute for Nursing Research, and it's just really important for nursing schools, students, and ultimately the public as well if there are cuts to nursing education. This is a very busy slide, but I wanted to do a little bit of past and present regarding the future of nursing, the Institute of Medicine Future of Nursing Report. And this was issued in 2010. There's going to be an update. The update's going to focus more, I'll continue with all of these, but then also focus on what can nursing do to address some of the health uh, inequities uh, and some of the other issues that are facing the general public. There were eight recommendations 10 years ago. Removing scope of practice barriers was the first one. You can see in 2020, we still have a challenge here in California. There's an assembly bill that uh, right now that's looking to expand full scope of practice for nurse practitioners. We'll see what happens around that. There are a lot of advocates for that right now. But again, we have not reached that in California. Expanding opportunities for nurses to lead collaborative improvement efforts. USD, I think, has been a forerunner in looking at how do we educate nurses, pharmacists, and physicians or uh, medical students. And so USD partners with UCSD every year looking at simulation to really improve those opportunities for nurses to lead efforts. Implement nurse residency programs. 
that's a little bit all over the map, but for those hospitals that are magnet designated, particularly here in California or in San Diego, that's my focus, it's important that anyone transitioning to the practice is in a nurse residency program, but if we're a magnet hospital, we need to demonstrate how we're transitioning those nurses. I can tell you here at Sharp, historically we've had five nurse residency programs, we just moved to a system program, and now the trend in nursing is to seek accreditation for your nurse residency programs, and I'm happy to say that at Sharp we have our virtual visit with the American Nurses Credentialing Center accreditation program in April, I mean in March. Increase the proportion of nurses with the BSN to 80% in 2020. In 2010, the BSN rate in the United States was 49%. The most recent prediction around that uh, is estimating that we'll reach 80% BSN by 2029. And that's through a lot of innovation, partnering, and I know there's some representatives here from Point Loma Nazarene, for example, the local community colleges partnering with, uh, with baccalaureate programs to have embedded RN to BSN programs. In the hospital level, we've driven our BSN rate primarily through our hiring practices, and we hire a lot of USD MEPIN grads. We love the second degree student. We are familiar with Linda Aiken's work about how a higher prepared ed a workforce um, leads to better patient outcomes. There was, and it's in tiny little print because I wanted to fit it on here, but there was just a recent article in Jonah in uh, uh, January that demonstrates that not only education level and certification increases, uh, well, decrease with every one unit increase in the percentage of BSN or certified nurses, there'll be a reduction in total patient falls per um, thousand patient days. And so there's more evidence out there about the importance of a higher prepared workforce. Double the number of nurses with a doctorate by 2020. This was easily met across the nation and also at Sharp Healthcare. And again, it's been the partnership between USD and Sharp that's contributed to that. Engaging nice nurses in lifelong learning, I think that's a given. Preparing nurses to lead, change, and advance health, that's the Nurses on Boards initiative. I looked this week. This week, there are about 7,100 reported nurses on boards. So reaching that goal, eventually, of 10,000 nurses on boards. And then looking at data, because data tells us how well we're doing, that's an ongoing initiative. There are a number of relevant, and that's kind of at the national level, there are a number of relevant organizations in California, and I'm just going to highlight several of them, but you can see there's nursing, there's healthcare related, there's regulatory, we're highly regulated here in California, and then of course we've got some union influence as well. So the board of registered nursing. The board is, we have some challenges with the board in California. Primarily the board is comprised of political appointees and they're kind of all over the map in their philosophy. One of the challenges is they've held firm to 25% simulation where other states have gone up as high as 50% simulation. ACNL, that's the organization that I'm a member of. They are very involved uh, at the leadership level. Here, they monitor and they try and influence the relevant bills. And again, they're looking closely at the AB 890 regarding nurse practitioner scope of practice health impact, and say so they routinely do some surveys. One of the things that they do is they conduct a survey of newly licensed nurses, and that's really getting a pulse on what's going on in terms of getting jobs here in California. What does that look like? And have a little bit more information about that. They also recently facilitated regional meetings across the state on pre-licensure RN clinical education capacity, better known as uh, clinical displacement. And that's really a hot political topic because hospitals were going to be mandated to take certain students, and we don't want to see that kind of regulation. So Health Impact took the lead to facilitate these regional meetings about how service and academia can come together to come up with solutions versus being mandated by a law. And then this is my last call to action, my last slide. There's a lot out there. It's Healthy Nurse, Healthy Nation. Again, it's the year of the nurse. A lot of information about nurse fatigue. And there's just a new article in American Nurse Today on what we need to do. But one of our challenges is, is in the practice setting, and I just heard Bernadette Melnick, the guru of evidence-based practice, last week at the Association of California Nurse Leaders annual conference, and she said 12-hour shifts have got to go. Now, we all know the challenge around that. Our nurses like 12-hour shifts. But we know what happens the last few hours of those shifts. We also know that our nurses are working in other organizations. So it's not just the 12-hour shifts that we work, they work in our organization. So Bernadette Melnick's point was, was we really need to look at 12-hour shifts and the fatigue factor. 
even working the night shifts. A lot of our new grads go to the night shift. So we have some challenges around fatigue, but there was just an article uh, in February of Jonah, Journal of Nursing Administration, and this was looking at nurse leader fatigue and nurse leader stress. And what really resonated me, with me uh, in this article was that nurse leaders need to put their own oxygen mask on before they can help others. So I think we have an opportunity there as well. And again, I, Dr. Hoyt has already uh, shared many very kind remarks about Dr. Roth, but I, again, just want to thank you for your contributions to my own career and to the success of our nurses at Sharp. So thank you.